on behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's New Brave New World Season Two. Our magazine partner for this series is the Week Journalism with a Human Touch. Our first session today is open the story of human progress. Johan Norberg in conversation with Shruti Rajagopalan. The session is presented in partnership with the delegation of the European Union to India. European Union Prize for Literature, Cultural Relations Platform, and Creative Europe. From the era of the hunter-gatherers to contemporary world relations, Johann Norberg's Open, The Story of Human Progress, takes us on a journey through time to analyze the key to human success. A stunning narration on the intrinsic human yearning for cooperation and profound need for belonging, Norberg presents a new framework of understanding history and dwells on why humans remain uneasy about openness. In conversation with Shuchi Raj Rajagopalan, he puts forward his views on why an open world and open economy is the need of the hour. Johan Norberg is an award-winning historian of ideas and documentary filmmaker from Sweden, <coughs> whose book has been published in more than 25 countries. His most recent book is Open, the Story of Human Progress, described as the clear, colorful, and convincing by The Economist. Shruti Rajakupalan is a senior research fellow of the Indian Political Economy Program at the Mercatus Center at the George Mason University and a fellow at the NYU School of Law. Dr. Rajakupalan writes the Impartial Spectator column in Mint and is the host of the Ideas of India podcast. <coughs> All our sessions that are available are on Facebook, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jepul Lit Fest JLF. <coughs> <coughs> Apologies for my bad cough, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Open the story of human progress. Johann Norberg in conversation <coughs> with Stuti Rajakopalan. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Sanjoy. Uh, thank you, Sanjoy. I hope you feel a little bit better in the next few minutes. And uh, Johan, it is such a pleasure and privilege to speak with you. Uh, I, I just had the opportunity to read the book and it's really uh, a sort of like an ode to human progress and also makes one of the best cases I have read in recent times uh, for both, you know, open societies and open markets, but also open minds and open thinking, uh, you know, which is the key to sort of unlock uh, human progress in the future. So just to start off, the sense that I got in the book, and I want to couch this in terms of the history of ideas, since you are a historian of ideas, is, uh, you know, Adam Smith talks about how humans have uh, an inherent proclivity to truck, barter, and trade. And Hobbes talked about how humans have a proclivity to rape, pillage, and plunder. And in one sense, the way you think about the world is this tension between the two and which one wins out. Uh, and in, in your uh, thesis, one part of this is the institutions that, you know, provide the incentives for individuals to either truck, partner and trade or, you know, uh, engage in other worse activities. But the other part of it is also within each individual themselves, there is a Smithian man and a Hobbesian man, and it is who wins out internally, right? So it's both how we uh, engage with ourselves, engage with the intimate order and engage with the extended order. Is this a good way to think about the project? Thank you, Shruti. I'm delighted to share a stage with you here today. And I'm delighted by the way you framed this question, because this is really what the book is about, that we've got a, a little Smithian and a little Hobbesian on, on each shoulder telling us what to do. Uh, trust other people, truck, barter, exchange, look at what they have to offer, what they can contribute, whether they can be potential partners, whether you can create more wealth and opportunities combined, or whether you should look at the others as them, potential threats and opponents, and you, someone you have to, well, basically eat or be eaten by. And uh, that's how I look on world history as well. We've had many golden eras in history from 
Ahsoka the Great's uh, empire over the entire Indian subcontinent more than 2,000 years ago to Song China and the Abbasid Caliphate until the Enlightenment uh, era in Europe. We've seen that they succeeded because they were relatively open compared to other cultures at the same time, open to influences, to people, to ideas, and to goods and services from other people so that they could make use of more brain power, more skill, more hard work from more people. But they also, sooner or later, they uh, came to an end. All of history's golden eras, apart from this one, we, we hope, at least not yet. And that's because that Smithian on one of our shoulders was uh, replaced with the Hobbesian on the other shoulder, telling us to be fearful, afraid, and suspicious about other cultures, other people, trade with others. And then what happens is that we basically we ruin it for others, but we ruin it for ourselves as well. We shoot ourselves in the foot because we shut ourselves off from all the innovations, all the creativity and the production that takes place in other parts of the world. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, at one point in the book, uh, you talk about how even to rape, pillage and plunder, one needs to have an open mind and truck barter and trade, like, you know, the, the way Genghis Khan put together his army or many other great conquerors, that even to, to indulge in the most Hobbesian activities and to do it at a level of competence and to do it over a long period of time, it is impossible to do it if we shut ourselves off from creative ideas, you know, other cultures, diversity, whether it comes in the form of tools, whether it comes in the form of technology, whether it comes in the form of strategy and warfare. So that I thought was a really lovely twist that to even be, an, be a Hobbesian, one needs to be a Smithian. Yes, that, and that is, quite surprising and counterintuitive. When you look at history's, some of history's worst warlords, like Genghis Khan, the Mongol emperor, he was one of the most vicious people on the planet. Uh, he, he killed and destroyed on a monumental scale. But in fact, the kind of policies that he applied inside the emperor, among the conquered people, were surprisingly liberal and tolerant. He was open to different religions. He was open to different ethnicities. He was very interested in uh, making sure that even outsiders belonging to another ethnicity and religion, that they are rapidly promoted through the ranks in the Mongol army, because it's more important to get the best people there, not people who are of your kin or of your religion. And that's why he managed to create the world's biggest land empire ever. When he invaded Europe in the 13th century with some 150,000 Mongol horsemen, only around a third of them were ethnic Mongols. And that was the key to the success because he attacked Europe with a combined then innovations, creativity, manpower of 20 different cultures. You know, I want to talk a little bit about what are the costs of not being open, right? And uh, you have a couple of great examples in the book. One is just a natural experiment where Tasmania gets cut off from Australia because of, uh, you know, rising sea levels. And there's the sharp divergence in, uh, you know, sort of both, you know, individual outcomes and outcomes as a society uh, between, uh, you know, the natives of Tasmania and those in Australia. And the other is more modern day examples where there are self-imposed Tasmanias like say North Korea, uh, you know, in most recent times. So can you talk a little bit about the costs of not being open? We all know openness is this wonderful thing, but the moment we engage on the other shoulder, which is telling us to be fearful, what happens? Yes, Tasmania is an extraordinary example because it is an island that it used to be a part of the Australian mainland, but then some 10,000 years ago, because of rising sea levels, it was shut off. Uh, a 200 kilometer stretch for 10,000 years. Tasmanians had to try to stay alive in isolation, just a couple of thousand people. And what happened when it was later on discovered uh, some 200 years ago then, um, they discovered that the development that had taken place among the aboriginals on the Australian mainland, which was 
really quite remarkable, the kind of technologies, the hunting uh, equipment, the uh, textiles, the clothes to shield themselves, the canoes they used to get around and to fish and the fishing gear and so on. None of that existed on Tasmania. Instead, they uh, realized that Tasmanians, even in the middle of, of winter, didn't have much clothes. They didn't have a, uh, any functioning canoes to go far. They didn't have any hunting equipment like fish traps, nets, bird snares, boomerangs, things like that. And it was not just that they hadn't developed new ones and had much of innovation. It was also the case that they had forgotten some technologies that had existed there 10,000 years ago. So it tells you that a small population of a couple of thousand people cut off from the rest of the world uh, is not enough to sustain innovation and, and rapid production. And it has been called by one archeologist famously, a slow strangulation of the mind. But that's the wrong way of looking at it. There was nothing wrong with their minds. It was the same kind of minds, the same brains as on the Australian mainland. The difference was that they had lost access to the minds and the brains of other people in other uh, parts of the world. And so that's the, the basic, question then, I think, historically, are if, if, if sometimes we think that we protect ourselves by shutting ourselves off from the world. We have this uh, fear of the world, so we build walls and barriers and trade barriers, and we think that that will keep us safe. But what it really means is that we lose access to everything else. And every time in history when we've seen longer periods of technology going into reverse, when we've seen uh, innovation suddenly ending, that's because people have shut themselves off from others. Sometimes because of disasters, because of invasions, the Roman Empire, they lost all the um, trade links with, with the rest of Europe and Northern Africa and the Middle East, so they went into reverse. Sometimes it's because of vicious dictators, like in North Korea, brutally shutting their populations off from others, and then we see the same thing. So that's the key message. Openness sounds like something warm and fussy and like we're generous to others, and that could obviously be part of it, but it's really long-term self-interest. It's really our way of using more than we have ourselves in isolation. And you know, you're absolutely right in, in the importance of knowledge. Normally, when we think about openness, we're either thinking about exchanging goods and services or we're thinking about the movement of people. But rarely do we zero in on what is it about openness that is making us progress. And that is the, the knowledge element, right? Uh, every time we trade with people, it is as if we have all the knowledge. So, you know, just to correct the, the quotation that you used about Tasmania, the slow strangulation of the mind, I think it would be the slow strangulation of the high mind, right? Yeah. The, the access to the mind of pretty much everyone else who is beautifully intertwined and interconnected in the global extended order, you know, that is, of course, permitted by, by trade and immigration. Uh, the other interesting thing that comes out of what you just said about Tasmania is there are two ways to evolve, right, primarily, and one is genetic evolution, and the other is cultural evolution. And, you know, the Tasmanian example tells us how genetic evolution works at this really slow glacial pace and takes, you know, centuries and millennia. Cultural evolution, on the other hand, takes place in the blink of an eye, right? You see another culture using a wheelbarrow or a particular tool or doing things in a particular way. And then immediately the human tendency of, you know, not just truck, barter and trade, but also the tendency to imitate takes over. And then it is as if we created that knowledge ourselves, uh, but it was always available in the world uh, to engage with. Yes, this is really the key. And this is really what great civilization, basically. Uh, Hayek, the, the great thinker and Nobel laureate in economics, he pointed out that civilization is really the ability to make use of knowledge that you don't understand. <laughs> and and that, that's the key, because historically, societies in isolation without uh, a, 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 an advanced civilization cannot really improve because they make use of too little information because everybody has to be a subsistence farmer, basically. So you can be incredibly smart. You have a lots of knowledge, 
but you have almost exactly the same knowledge as your neighbor and as people in that other village about the crops, about the soil, about the weather, and so on. And, and in that case, you can't make that much progress. The, the problem in a way is that we are all Renaissance men. We have to understand everything ourselves. The key to rapid advances in human living conditions is to surpass that stage and make use of knowledge that others possess so that I might be a farmer and I still specialize in soil and, and, and the crops, but someone else, my neighbor can specialize in electric uh, engines and the other neighbor can specialize in the human body and the organs and how to uh, keep them safe from particular cases of disease. And then we can all truck, barter and exchange, uh, exchange with one another. And then we increase the accumulated knowledge that we make use of and that makes, makes an incredible difference in our life standard in a, in a short period of time. You know, what you said just reminded me of Matt Ridley and some of his latest work, which is also on innovation. And his argument is very much along your lines, which is that we need a liberal and open uh, order, you know, which is supported by institutions for innovation to really flourish because one cannot plan innovation. It happens over a series of accidents, you know, uh, and that's how human progress takes place. But at one point, Matt Ridley says that ideas must have sex, right? It's, it's really the cross-pollination of ideas and it's a lovely turn of phrase that he has, but I, I don't think we have a better uh, version of it. Ideas must have sex and give birth to new ideas. And that is really the key to, to human progress. And if we, if we compartmentalize people and don't allow them to meet, uh, then we are in this new space of each individual, each family member is exactly the same. And we don't have that much in terms of, uh, you know, innovation or mimicking unless a genius comes around. And even then a genius can't do much by themselves. Quite right. And, and that's something that fascinates me. And uh, because you can find geniuses in all cultures, in all civilizations who do great work. You can see how, and I think Matt Ridley has uh, written about this quite extensively as well, that uh, you find attempts to create magnificent innovations in many different cultures, but if they don't have an ecosystem where they can connect with others, uh, with uh, other ideas, other technologies, financial markets and so on, nothing much happens. Why was the personal computer not developed in, in the Soviet Union? Well, you know, the, the Soviet Union and its planned economy, they also had great tinkerers who uh, they took American computers and reverse engineered them and, and came up with a great versions. And, and they showed the Politburo, look, we can do this. Uh, but the Politburo just said, nah, we're not that interested because why should we be interested in a way of sorting library cards or, or food recipes in a better way? It just doesn't make sense. We should invest more in, well, steel and wheat, basically, because that's what the people need. And I think I would have made the same decision at that point because we couldn't see what would happen with, with a PC in the long term. Um, the difference and why it happened in a country like the United States was that because of that decentralization, because of a a lack of, of, of decarpentalization. So uh, the tinkerers and the thinkers, they met the hippies and the programmers and the, the militaries and the universities, and they all combined and fought and competed and cooperated. And then it just took a couple of people who really believed in this idea. And they didn't have to go to a Politburo. They could go to one angel investor who was interested in this. They could go to one um, retailer who wanted to sell the first Apple computer, for example. And then things that you wouldn't have been able to foresee came into place. Uh, there was not a big consumer market initially, but perhaps it was that rich man who wanted to use a computer as a status symbol. It could be a couple of... Uh, hackers who just wanted to tear it apart and see what it was and kids who just wanted to play video games on the computer and they came up with new ideas on how to use it and so there was feedback back to the producers and they developed it further and then suddenly here we are being able to have this kind of of a book event uh, on, on different continents at the same time just because of that those weirdos <laughs> meeting and coming up with strange new ideas.
<laughs> no, and I'm grateful to them. Now, I want to turn to the second half of your book, you know, which is you not just make a great case for like, you know, having open minds, open societies. I encourage the listeners to read the book. It is rife with great examples from history. And, you know, there is no sort of uh, westernization or colonization. You literally give us every example from different cultures, different parts of the world. So I really encourage people to read your case for openness. But I want to switch to some of the threats uh, that we have towards openness, right? So one part of it is uh, you address this both in your globalization discussion from many years ago and, and even in this book on how there are winners and losers with globalization, right? And sometimes the losers who lose, they are real people, right? People who've really lost their jobs. It's easy to say that in a marketplace, resources can readjust and go to their highest valued use, but these are people who can't make their mortgage, you know, their kids are pulled out of classes, their communities are falling apart, and that is one kind of threat um, to globalization. Another kind is uh, not that there are winners and losers, but that there are some people who are not winning as much as other people. Right. And there is this sense of inequality of status or threat to, you know, people's status and standing in society. So it's not so much that it's a zero sum in terms of globalization for them. It's more that they fear their identity in some way is getting lost. Can you talk us through some of this and what might be a good way, uh, you know, to to counteract this? Because as you point out, the empirical work on how, you know, the benefits of free trade are for everyone to see. And still it's an idea that doesn't easily penetrate, you know, to the ordinary person or the ordinary voter or the ordinary factory worker. Yes, that's correct. And, and this, uh, this will always be something that haunts us and threatens to upend openness in various ways. Uh, as you point out, not everybody is a winner. When economists look at it in total, it seems like trade generally creates um, a, a cost-benefit ratio of about uh, 1 to 20. So 20 is the benefits, 1 is the cost to people who lose jobs, uh, companies and, and factories put out of business and so on. So the 20 is obviously 20 fold uh, more impressive. We should all encourage therefore free trade and make sure that more people get access to it. Uh, but we still have that one, that, uh, that one in the 120 cost to benefit ratio. And we will always have that with us. And therefore we must work very hard to make sure that we have so such dynamic society so that those who lose out can rapidly get new jobs, get new opportunities. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's so important never to be sort of satisfied with the kind of economic models and the production that we have, because we always have to come up with new ideas, new technologies, and make sure that new businesses can expand and hire people in those areas. But there's even if we manage to do that, there is that second problem that you manage. Some people will always lose relatively, especially as new uh, generations, um, new minorities, when uh, women, say, enter the workforce, it means that, relatively speaking, those who used to be in charge lose out. And many people also got much of their, um, their status, their role, their identity in society from what they used to have on the labor market in the economic uh, sectors where they were involved. And therefore, any kind of change will threaten their relative status. And that's something that's very, very difficult to deal with because if we give more people opportunities, it will buy, it, it will automatically mean that some people will lose relatively because they're not in charge as they used to be. And this is something that has often historically resulted in backlashes. Uh, economic historians talk about it as Cardwell's law, uh, after the technology writer Joe Cardwell, who pointed out that there are always incumbents in, could be in ideas, in religion, in politics, but often in the economy. Uh, people who used to run the show had the best jobs, had the best, biggest businesses, and they are always threatened by innovation and by change, and they always hold back. Uh, and sometimes, once in a while, and that's what Cardwell's law says, um, sometimes people who sit on the fence 
they feel threatened in a bigger way and they come down on the side of the threatened incumbents and then we begin to dismantle this openness and and the great irony is obviously that this ruins it uh, for that those old incumbents as well because we see less of uh, of uh, production and innovation in those cultures to, uh, and, and even long term so even for for those those people who lose relative status i think it's it's so incredibly important to point out that uh, to manage to open up the new sectors the new technologies that will give them space and room to to function there because even if you are the 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 king in a small pond uh, you will you'll benefit in absolute terms by uh, being more equal to others in a bigger pond with more a total larger total pool of wealth you know this is interesting so when we look at how people behave not just what they say people are constantly picking a uh, greater levels of inequality and lower levels of poverty in the trade off between the two right you constantly see migration of people from rural areas to urban areas urban areas are typically more congested they're more anonymous so there is a loss of status and uh, you know of course they are more unequal all urban areas have like a higher gini coefficient if you know so to speak than rural areas which tend to be much more uniformly poor you see much less reverse migration so if we think about what people do people prefer to exit poverty and they embrace inequality if we actually look at what people say and how people vote then the conversation tends to be very very different can you explain why this happens this has been a puzzle to me for for a long time and this is a very good and an important point and it re relates to one major theme in my book and that's how we behave as individuals and as groups because as individuals we are mostly interested in expanding opportunities and uh, choice and wealth uh, for us and our loved ones and we engage constantly trying to look at uh, ways of participating and exchanging with others for mutual benefit so therefore we're not that uh, so, sort of historically minded thinking about where we fit in relatively long term and so on we just want improvements and progress yeah. but when we start to think of ourselves as members of a group we start to think about where is our group in relation to other groups and that's when you begin to think that it's not that we have common problems to solve but rather other groups to beat and that's when we begin to think about this relative status in so many ways and and that's very problematic because then we we stop thinking of mutual gains we start to think about zero sum games and we think about how we can gain relative to others and we often do that unfortunately historically by ruining ruining it for for other people and other groups and this is i think part of our evolution and our our instincts because as individuals we're looking for opportunities but we're also very rapidly uh, we rapidly we become suspicious about other groups other tribes other bands because they are the ones you know after mankind reached the top of the food chain the only thing that could threaten us was other groups other tribes who cooperated even better than we did so that they could steal and kill us and that's why we always keep a suspicious eye on other groups and where are they and what can they do to us and uh, to me i think i mean there's a couple of million years of evolution <laughs> that explains this so it's not something that we can easily deal with but one key is to make sure that we try to make sure that as many choices are being done individually by us as individual human beings and as families rather than as members of a collective of a group Uh, when we decide on where to move what to do which kind of job which partnerships which cooperation to to be a part of then we try to find those positive sum gains where we can help others as well but the moment we think that we are one group and we're in fierce competition with other groups and that could happen at the voting booth it could happen when we think of politics in a in a more theoretical way and uh, when we have been triggered to think of ourselves as 
members of a group rather than as individuals. Then we look at zero-sum games and we try to ruin it for others. And that, ironically, just like Tasmanians, we ruin it for ourselves as well. No, absolutely. And I think what you're saying has an enormous amount of relevance to India, especially in the present moment. Uh, you know, there are two things going on. One, of course, there is a big uh, change in a sense, a reverse from the 1990s reform. The new, uh, you know, order of the day for the Modi administration is Atmanirbhar, which means self-sufficient in Hindi. And, you know, self-sufficiency, as, as you point out over and over again in your book, is, you know, slow uh, decline and eventual death of any civilization and society. But the other element that you talk about is, uh, you know, these different identities that take over, that we have a trader in us, but we also have a, a, a tribal in us, right? And it's the trader and the tribal which are constantly in conflict. And here I wanted to talk about a slightly different idea, which comes from Amartya Sen. You know, it is not that we don't have uh, the identity, uh, or each one doesn't have a identity. It is actually that each one of us has many, many, many identities, right? I am uh, not just an Indian. I'm also a resident of Virginia, right? I'm also a member of George Mason University and that community and, and NYU and that community. And, and I also support, you know, the Indian uh, cricket team, right? Uh, and I also support like, you know, a particular, uh, I, I support the Yankees, for instance, or, or, you know, the Bulls. So there are so many versions of me in terms of which group I believe belong to. And in one sense, all the problem arises when one identity is uh, superseding all the others. And this, of course, can happen because of political reasons or other reasons. So it's not just what I got from your book was it's not just that the identity is the problem. It is that a single monolithic identity uh, is, is what is causing uh, this kind of tension to prop up over and over again. Yes. That's exactly the problem. We contain multitudes. We have so many different identities. And that's one of the things that has made it possible for us to, um, to move past ancient tribalism and just kin, because suddenly we see that uh, that guy over the, on the other side of the river uh, is also a, a farmer, a father, perhaps cheers on the same team. And that creates some sort of trust and then we begin to exchange and we move further. And um, so we are the circles of people whom we can identify with and feel some sort of empathy with constantly expands. We realize that they are like us, even though they speak another language or they look differently. Um, and, and it helps when we understand these things. I think actually, literature since this is a book festival historically literature has been one of the most important things in extending empathy and the circles of respect like that because suddenly we can read about people often in the first person who work with different things brought up on the other side of the planet but they feel like us and they think like us and they behave like us and we can suddenly relate to them as well and and it helps then then when we find these different things that we do have in common and that creates different groups. It's a very fluid form of, if it's tribalism, it's a very fluid form of tribalism and we can suddenly focus on something different and that changes our entire perspective on others. The problem is when one of these identities push all the others away and we begin to think that it's just us and it's just them. And this is often what de demagogues do. That's their secret to attain power because they try to explain to us that the only thing important about us is our way of, of uh, showing faith in, in uh, uh, expressing our faith or our language or our partic one particular background that we happen to have. And everybody else, they are quite different. That triggers this dangerous form of tribalism when we immediately begin to see, and this is something that we can see in all psychological experiments, we begin to think that everybody else on the other side, they are basically just the same and they, they are bad uh, people, whereas those on our side, we are, we can understand why they do what they do. If they, one of us behaves in a bad way, it's probably because they had a good reason to it, but those on the other side, they did it because they're bad people. And 
and, and that triggers many forms of intolerance and, and racism and xenophobia historically, and it's often a, a very um, bad way to go. The, the way to get out of that is to point out, to, to show the individuals and to make us understand that they are individuals li just like you and I, and they're not only defined by this particular difference between us. And those differences, they, they look so big just because this is the one, uh, the only area that we look at right now. We can see how rapidly this changes in, in present political circumstances in, in Britain. You know, the, the last uh, poll that I saw was about Britain leaving the European Union, how suddenly uh, some 87% uh, identify themselves suddenly on their, on their take on the Brexit issue, whether they are Brexiteers or Remainers. 87%. The interesting thing is that that's actually 15 percentage points more than even bothered to turn out to vote in the referendum on Brexit. So it just shows you that when the issue becomes politically salient, we only think of ourselves in terms of that identity. And that is really a way of making ourselves a disfavor and not understanding that we're so much more and so is everybody else. You know, uh, I want to, uh, we're uh, at the end of our time and there's some very interesting questions that are going to come up. Uh, but I just wanted to end on one question, which is, so much of what you say is so obvious. You know, the second one reads it, it's like, of course, you know, this, this makes perfect sense. How have we failed as, uh, you know, classical liberals in promoting these ideas that even ideas which are so obvious where there's massive amounts of empirical evidence are just, uh, you know, they don't penetrate popular culture. And even if they do, like in the 1990s in India, they sort of boomerang and go away a few years later. So what is the failure on, on our part? You know, uh, uh, you're writing books, I'm writing columns, I have beautiful forums like, you know, the Jaipur Literature Festival. So where are we going wrong? <laughs> um, well, I, I might suggest a couple of, of uh, answers, but first of all, I'm not sure it means that we're actually doing something wrong, because you could say the same thing about, you know, we started by talking about Adam Smith. Well, you know, he solved many of these things uh, 250 years ago. <laughs> uh, where did he go wrong, since we have to repeat it constantly? Well, I think that's it's more that we're up against a major challenge, and that challenge is part of us as well. It's our double nature. It is, it is human nature. You know, if it's the Smith and the Hobbes on, on each of our shoulders. If we condense the whole of Homo sapiens existence, 300,000 years into the, just 24 hours, well, the 200 years when we've really seen rapid economic growth, innovation, mutual gains be between even different countries and um, basically creating the modern world and increased the lifespans from 30 years to more than 70 years, reduced extreme poverty from 90% uh, to 9% today. It's amazing, those 200 years, but it's just the last minute. It's just the last 60 seconds of those 24 hours. So that's where almost everything that makes our lives comfortable and, and, uh, and, and decent, our health, sanitation, lifespans, wealth, and so on, Almost all of it came from those 60 seconds, but that's obviously not where our instincts come from. Our fears, our attitudes, many of our belief systems, they come from often the previous 86,400 seconds. Yeah. So it's not different, it's not strange that some of these ideas on how to create mutual gains, how we can cooperate and, and create more rather than thinking of the other tribe as the constant threat, that, that it's difficult to get people and to get ourselves to understand it because it's a very new phenomena and our brains aren't really evolved, haven't really evolved to deal with it. It's been, it's evolved to deal with survival issues uh, on, on great savannas. And, mm -hmm. and then obviously there are other things that we have to think about rather than sort of how accumulated wealth of, of a couple of percentage points uh, a year can uh, change the world from, from misery to uh, 
to middle class. That's something that we have to understand intellectually rather than emotionally. And therefore, it has to be explained and understood again and again. And I think we will uh, also see backlashes again and again because uh, we're up against ourselves. We've met the enemy and it's ourselves. <laughs> It's no, uh, this is a great note to, to, you know, when I should stop monopolizing your time. We have some excellent questions. I want to start with Kavita Shannon. And this is all you talk about this a little bit in your book, but it'll be great for the listeners to hear. What are the virtues of an open system in a world that is facing a pandemic? And if I might add for many who think that the pandemic is a result of the open system. That's a great question and an important one. Um, so let me give three brief uh, um, answers to this one or examples. Uh, first of all, it, if we go even further back in time and think about pandemics generally, it seems actually, and now I'm not talking about the present one, I'm not talking about uh, the present pandemic, but it seems like uh, there is actually a an important point to mobility, to human mobility, to reduce the risks of pandemics. Researchers have looked at, at, at this and made many models. And it, since most diseases are just a new version of an old disease, just a couple of mutations away, it means that we often have cross immunity to, for example, the, the last flu that we had. So if we experienced it in uh, this way and it has moved around the world, it means that if it doesn't have time and place to develop and mutate dramatically for a long time in isolation, but instead moves across the planet once every year or so, it means that it's probably not as lethal as it would otherwise be. And there are a couple of researchers at uh, uh, Tel Aviv and I think Oxford University who made a model, and they suggested that one of the reasons why we haven't seen a new Spanish flu, the, the terrible flu that we saw 100 years ago, is probably because of the jet engine. If, if we didn't have the jet engine so that we see a seasonal flu, constantly giving us a, a, a sneeze uh, uh, once a year, it would probably have developed in isolation and mutated so that we would have seen a more apocalyptic flu at least a couple of times since then. Now that doesn't help if, we, if suddenly something comes from the animal kingdom and mutates and, and uh, approaches us. Then we're up against the, another enemy and it's more difficult. Then there are two other aspects that I think are important when it, in terms of, of openness. The first one is what we do need is knowledge, knowledge about how to, what has happened and uh, how it strikes and knowledge about uh, how, what we can do about it. And then we know that closed systems are bad at it because this wouldn't have happened unless the communist party in China uh, tried to to silence any kind of dissident, any kind of rumor about this. And it's not just me, a sort of a Swedish classical liberal saying this, it's even the Chinese, the highest court in China who recently said that hadn't police in Wuhan tried to stop these rumors, then we would might have been able to contain it. People would have behaved in another way, stopped going to the animal markets and wore masks and so on. And in that case, this might not have slipped out of Wuhan at all. Rumors end, and this is an exact quote from uh, the Chinese highest court, rumors end when there is openness. So that's something for the, the Communist Party and for uh, everybody else who believes in closed societies to ponder. This wouldn't have happened had it been an open society where people were allowed to spread the information that they had. But then when it got out, there is only one way to deal with it. And it's not by shutting down societies. We've done that. We've shut down societies, travel all around the world, and it's still spreading all around the world. The only way to deal with this is through cooperation between different research teams, uh, drugs companies, hospitals around the world, so that they can constantly look at the virus from different uh, sides, read the genome of the virus, and come up with the best treatment and a possible vaccine. And I just read that one, it seems like one is coming in November from one of the uh, our biggest drugs uh, manufacturers now. And 
And that can only happen in an open, globalized society where we all share information and exchange knowledge about this virus constantly. Um, so, for example, in this way, digital communication, these research teams, they weren't there when we had the Spanish flu 100 years ago. They couldn't compare notes and therefore they couldn't come up with a solution. Um, it took mankind 3,000 years to develop a vaccine against uh, polio. Uh, it probably doesn't take more than three months to come up with plenty of drugs and potential vaccines this time around. No, and it's amazing because uh, I encourage, I recently read a great story on how the smallpox vaccine had to travel across the world because they had to inoculate each person. So it was literally arm to arm delivery and each person that was successfully inoculated, they would extract and then inoculate the next person. And, you know, it was sort of like this global human chain. And of course, it took a long time. And the BBC recently did a great story on how the, the queens and princesses of the Vadear family in Mysore uh, actually, you know, did some uh, advertisements to tell people that, you know, getting inoculated is safe. But it took a long time. And, and in this instance, we know that through global cooperation, you know, the technology is coming from one place. Most likely the world is going to be inoculated on a vaccine which is made in India, you know, at the Indian Serum Institute, which is the largest producer in the world. And also that we will know about it instantly and we'll be able to get it across to different countries to, you know, billions of people in a much shorter span of time. So actually the hive mind helps us solve the problem faster, but the extended order also helps us deliver the solution uh, faster in a sense, right? So, so without the, the extended order or openness, we're, we're all gonna eventually die of some, some terrible diseases. Um, Nilanjana and that's a very good point. 3,000 years had we had a smallpox vaccine or polio vaccine, we wouldn't have been able to distribute it around the world. Yeah. Uh, so Nilanjana asked that looking at America, Sweden, and India, what are the biggest issues in global economics and politics today? Um, I think if uh, there are three very different countries and uh, it's difficult to give one uh, short answer that covers it all, I would say. Um, but if I were to do that uh, and fairly simplified, I think the, um, the the question for all of these countries is whether we manage to keep our own domestic sectors open to new technologies and new innovations so that we can build new companies and new um, business models and whether we keep our borders and our supply chains open so that we can trade and exchange with everybody else uh, because uh, those two versions of, of closeness is, are the ones that threaten our, our uh, economies. The one back home where we uh, fear new technologies and we always fear new technologies and business models because we think that now if we do that we will ruin what we used to have, what we used to do, what created jobs back in the past. And, and that's correct, but it's also the only way to cre create the new jobs and the new um, business models that will make it uh, make us successful in, in the long run. Uh, but we also have to keep our, our economies open to exchange with others, partly to make sure that we force our companies and our best minds to always be competitive and to stay up to date with what happens everybody else. That's the best way to keep ourselves on our toes, to make sure that we face competition, but then also to make sure that we have access to, to other markets and to each other's markets so that we can specialize and create more in, in combination. That would be the, the major one. Now we are dealing with the, uh, the pandemic and the shutdowns of our various economies. And how do we get out of that? The fear is that we will see this push for self-sufficiency in various uh, sectors. And it's, a, it's very natural that we face that because suddenly we see so shortages in certain sectors. We didn't get the right protective material, for example. But you know, a country like China was already self-sufficient and produced all the masks and surgical uh, gloves that it needed, but that didn't help. They also saw a shortage when demand for it increased 50-fold 
That's what happens when we see strange surprises and, and disasters like this. So the only key to, to dealing with it is to be flexible so that we can suddenly ramp up uh, production and to make sure to keep markets open so that we can get it from the factories that stay open. If we try to be self-sufficient locally, you know, most disasters strike locally as well. Yeah. So if we have a shutdown locally and it could might be a be a flood, it could be uh, energy or, or problems or cyber uh, security problems or what have you. Most problems strike locally. And if we are just locally sufficient in everything, it means that any kind of disaster is a total disaster. It means that we cannot get the supplies, the goods, the services that we need from other places. So stay open is the main challenge for the future. Uh, thank you so much. That's a great note to end on. I strongly recommend... I think Shruti has frozen your hand for a moment. Uh, Shruti, you're back. Uh, yes, yeah. I was saying, look, I think this year's Diwali gift should be, you know, Johan's open making a case for human prosperity in addition to Lakshmi Puja and all the other things that, that one does. And, uh, you know, I think it's one of the most important books that is being written and some of the most important ideas uh, for the next decade of whatever we encounter as, as a civilization. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Johan. Thank you so much, Shruti. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation and ideas must have sex. And that's the only way to continue to make them evolve uh, as we, we've seen. I don't know whether, Shruti, you know this, but perhaps Johan doesn't. You know, when the lockdown happened uh, in India on the 23rd of March, one of the things that we were very clear about in at Team Burke and GLF was that even while every condominium and gated community started becoming a republic and not letting people in and out and shutting down, we said we must find a way to continue the free flow of knowledge and information. Because without that, as you rightly said, how would you get this vaccine to be developed in such a short period of time? 3000 years and you know a couple of months here and there uh, in this period, it would have been absolutely impossible. That was fascinating. The Tasmanian story has really got one thinking, of course, the fact that they then walked through, the new settlers walked through Tasmania hand in hand and shot each one of the uh, Aboriginal people there uh, is a whole different story. Uh, but fascinating. Uh, and as Shruti rightly said, uh, Johan's book is a must read about why we must keep ourselves open. And it's not enough to say uh, that, that the new global is local. Uh, it's absolutely imperative. We've seen this in India again and again. Every time there is a calamity, whether it's, uh, 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 whether it's drought or flood, you know, the, the minstrels or the performers or the artisans then move to the next district. And what we've seen now is that everything is just shut down. No, that's absolutely. The other and, and big calamity for... that's facing us in different yeah, parts of the world. Thank you for yeah, the opportunity is, for, uh, for having this engage, uh, you know, the, sort of to discuss the, uh, to bring people together on the open forum or the platform to have the conversation, as you say, is the start of the journey. So thank you yes. to for that. Yeah, thank you so much thank for you making both. it possible for more ideas to have sex, basically. Thank you. And this session is presented in partnership with the delegation of the European Union to India. European Union Prize for Literature, the Cultural Relations Platform in Creative Europe. Uh, if you have enjoyed this conversation, do log back on at 8.30 p.m. for our next session, Love Without a Story, Arundhati Subramaniam, in conversation with Rahul Pandita. Versatile poet and writer Arundhati Subramaniam conjures the essence of the spiritual and the sublime through her writing practice. Subramaniam's latest book of poems, Love Without a Story, circles the ideas of time, intimacy, and the urgency of conversations. See you at 8.30 p.m.